Welcome to Got to Run with Will. This is your host, Josh Pesson. While working on my family tree years ago, I was given great advice by someone. They said I should find the oldest member of my family and ask them questions about our family history. Our next very special guest is one of the oldest members of the local running community today. He has a running history that goes back since the 1930s till the present. He's a local legend throughout the Staten Island running community as well as the greater New York City running community. He was a teacher, a runner, and a successful track coach who has helped bring runners to the Olympics. Today's special episode is in honor of Gary Corbett, the son of Ted Corbett, who was the very first president of the New York City Roadrunners Club. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you today's very special guest, Mr. Bill Welsh. With an introduction like that, what can I lose? <laughs> <laughs> when did you first start running? Uh, 1943. 43. I was in grammar school, mm -hmm. and I found out that by walking and jogging, I could go from the school to home much faster than the school bus. Wow. So that started it. I didn't realize it was a sport, yeah. but it was a means of getting home, time to walk my pet dog yeah. or do whatever I needed to be done around the house. When did you first get more serious about running, where you started to get, get competitive? Well, when I was doing that running, <laughs> I met a man named Mike Dwyer. He had coached Curtis to nine city championships. Mm -hmm. And he was in Clove Lakes when I was walking and jogging. Right. And I felt I can keep up with this old man. <laughs> but I found out I couldn't. And that annoyed me that mm -hmm. somebody so old could run so well. Mm -hmm. And so I went chasing after him. Ah. And I was told, this is not Alphonse Gaston. We come to a place where yeah. you have to go. You go. Right. Not pass it off to the other guy. Ah, OK. My high school didn't have a track team. Oh. So I had to form one. You had to form a track team because yeah. your high school didn't, OK. Wow. And then I had some successful runners. Yeah. Like a 47 second 400 meter man, a seven foot plus high jumper. Right, wow. And a six time city champ for the distance running. Wow, what a lineup. Uh, when did you start running for Milrose, would you say? Well, the Milrose came along because it was a club. I was in Van Cortland Park mm -hmm. or McCombs Dam Park, one of the two. McCombs Dam Park. I saw these guys yeah. who were Milrose Club. Mm -hmm. And I asked if I could join them. And to my satisfaction and pleasure, I wound up as a member of the Milrose Athletic. And this while you're living in Staten Island, right? Oh, I still live in Staten Island. Right, so you would, there would be a big commute for those races for you, right? Yeah, it's just uh, travel to the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was easy hmm. in comparison to what others were doing. But I found out the public school coaches all went home and they didn't stay around ah. after the school year ended. I see. And that's a time when you can pick up a lot on right. the other guys. Right, right, yeah. Tell us about Joe Kleinerman. How was he? Well, How, Joe well did you know? Kleinerman was yeah. a good team man. Mm -hmm. He was very helpful to me. And he was a Milrose member too, he right? He was a Milrose man from 
probably back in the 1930s, mm -hmm. definitely in the 40s, and almost, almost to this day. Mm. Joe Kleinerman is a big influence on road running. So he was your uh, competitor? Oh, he was a good competitor. He pushed you, huh? But he was older. Oh, he was older and, than you. And being young, mm -hmm. I didn't have any problem if we were called on to yes. run against him. Mm -hmm. I ran with him yeah. and learned from him. Okay. Do you recall Vic Drygall? Oh, Vic Drygall was a tremendous champ and very quiet man. He went to Europe twice, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't know, but he'd only run in races when he was in shape to beat everybody. Mm -hmm. And I learned simply get on the track right. and run from Vic. Yeah. He was a great, great runner. And he was also uh, Melrose? And he was Melrose. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was no question I wanted to be part of that club. Right. Even though there was a Staten Island club at the time, but you couldn't, with their rules, be belong to two different clubs. Ah, I see. So I stayed with the Melrose. Which Staten Island club was it at the time? Staten Island Athletic Club. Oh, SIAC. Yeah, SIAC. We're talking 19... 43, 43 to the present oh. day. I see. I like to think to the present day. How about John Garlip? Does that ring a bell, John Garlip? Garlip? Yeah. Yeah, very tough runner. Good man. And again, he made that Milrose team the thing about long distance running Yeah. would be a three-man team as opposed to shorter distances where it would be a, a five-man team. I see. Marathons would be the top three. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had to be in pretty good shape to beat somebody like John Gollum. What were the popular distances at the time? Race, what was the popular race distance? Distance? Yeah. I found out I could do three miles every day. Ah, uh, three miles, okay. And then I also found out that if you did too much, you were in trouble. Uh. So I had to meet a happy, happy medium somewhere. Doing three miles was not enough, but running for over an hour wasn't much fun either. Right. So somewhere in between. And then I found out about a man in Europe, Emil Zadepec, yeah, who did 400s, and he did like 20 of them. Wow. And that was unheard of. 20 times a 400. Just an unbelievably great athlete. And that helped him instead of uh, hurt well, him, right? That, he went to the Olympics, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you remember Gary Murky? I know he was one of the first New York City Marathon winners. Oh, oh Gary Murky. Yeah. Yeah. He was another good man with Gollop. It was like they were a team together. Mm -hmm. Gollop and Murky. Being from Staten Island, it was like I wasn't part of that, but I wanted to be. Mm. It's just that we lived on Staten Island, but they were good runners and good people, and they were Milrose. Mm -hmm. So whatever contribution I could make, I tried. I see. He opened the Super Runner shop eventually, his own oh, business. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He sold shoes out of his trunk of his car. Yeah, I bought a pair. Oh, yeah? So that was his store at the time. He was selling them right out of his yeah, car trunk. Yeah. Ah. What do you remember most about representing Milrose? I was very proud to be part of that. Mm -hmm. Milrose goes back quite a ways. They've had champions all along. Plus, they had a good coach. Mm -hmm. 
man named Tim O'Connor. Tim O'Connor, okay. I was amazed when he said the one summer, and I'm running a few summers, Bill, you're on your own. I'm going home to meet my parents. <laughs> and I'm thinking, this man's in his 80s, and he's going home to meet his parents. <laughs> How old are his parents then? <laughs> Whatever he's doing, I want to do. <laughs> Well, look at you. You're 93 right now, and you're still yeah. alive and kicking. Yeah. yeah, that's great. That's great. So maybe you, you got some uh, good advice. I think I'm a better joke teller. <laughs> you're a better joke teller than an athlete, than a runner? <laughs> Do you call the Met AAU team? Remember that? Met AAU? Yeah. Did you remember having battles there with other runners? Like with the New York Pioneer Club? And then uh, New York Athletic Club? Yep. Yeah, could you tell us about they, that? They were, New York Athletic Club gave me an impression. Hoi polloi. They were the wealthy. Mm -hmm. And we were the poor. Uh, and the Pioneer Club was just great. Integrated. Black and white together. Right. But I'm from Staten Island, and I have to travel, and I wound up somehow with the Melrose, with uh, Vic Durgal, mm -hmm. and I was impressed by him very much. And so I wound up with the Melrose. John Gollop was mm -hmm. another Melrose member. Right now, I can't think of who was all in there, but... They were a good down-to-earth team. Yeah. So let's talk more about the New York Pioneer Club. Ted Corbett, he was instrumental in getting started, right? Him and someone else? Ted Corbett was a good man, and he was an Olympian, mm -hmm. and he ran long distances. I was highly impressed by him. Mm -hmm. But my coach in college put me with the athletic club, New York, and uh, I just didn't feel comfortable. Like, they didn't represent me, Yeah. and I'm not representing them. So they were exclusive so, and not inclusive. So uh, yeah. somewhere in between, I wanted to fit in. Right. And uh, Ted Corbett was a good man and a great distance runner. He was very welcoming, huh? To, oh, to all? Tremendous. I run for hours. Yeah. So I was highly impressed by Ted, but I was with the Melrose mm -hmm. and I wasn't going to change. I see. But I didn't mean I couldn't wish Ted and the other guys mm -hmm. good luck right. when the gun went off. Right. And they were your competitors, right? For many yeah. races. Do you remember Joe Yancey at all? Joe he... Yancey was a coach and, again, a good man. I think his daughter worked in attendance at my high school, and so I would see her all the time, and I was highly impressed. By... But Joe Yancey was a great coach. Mm -hmm. He started the Pioneer Club, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that it, uh, if you could compete for two clubs, you would choose uh, Milrose and uh, uh, NYPC. Pioneer Club. Yeah, so you would run for those two clubs. Yeah. No, no uh, other club, right? Pioneer Club. Police Department. No, no, Pioneer, P Pioneer Club, NYPC. That was the yeah, uh, abbreviation. NYPD. So you would. My father was a yeah. cop. Yeah. So I felt at home running for them, but they weren't. Um, Big enough or uh, fulfilled enough to keep it going. What's and that, so, the Pioneer Club, you mean? No, the New York Police Department. Oh, do they have they had their they own running club? A team ah. For a short amount of time. I see. But they didn't have enough runners? No. Nah. Ah, I see. I know they have a big uh, running club now because there's a, a, a lot more cops running now. I, I guess, you know, it's a very stressful <laughs> job and you, running is a great outlet, yeah. you know? Um, so no, I'm, I'm asking about Milrose and NYPC. You said 
you once told me that um, you would you would compete with those clubs, but no other clubs. Those are your favorite clubs. But let's say that I felt that I could run with uh, with the Melrose and be comfortable about it. Mm -hmm. And it was not like I left Staten Island. Yeah. There were some Staten Island runners mm -hmm. who felt offended that I was running with another club off Staten Island. Ah. But they weren't up to the standards that I felt I wanted to be part of. I see. And, uh, so, but they lived out in Queens and, yeah, I didn't feel I was betraying any Staten Islanders. They just didn't have the team. Yet they had one or two good runners. Bobby Oraysom was one mm -hmm. very good runner. Yeah. Yeah, Bobby Oraysom, he's still alive and well. And yeah. I think, yeah, he's doing cycling now because of uh, previous running related injuries. But he's doing yeah. well with cycling, I hear now. Yeah. yeah. So the Pioneer Club, uh, you said you liked them. I know one of their, um, their philosophies is uh, they were very wel welcoming to all, uh, all races. They, uh, they didn't discriminate. They welcomed Jewish and, uh, and all abilities, right? Yeah. yeah. They were inclusive, right? Yeah. That's good. And you felt comfortable with that club? Yeah. But again, we go back to when I started. Like Joe Kleinerman mm -hmm. was very helpful and was part of the Milrose. Mm -hmm. But that's way back. Yeah. That's before there was even a, a New York City marathon. Yeah. I can't remember when that started. But Joe Kleinerman was definitely a big part of that coming about. Ted Corbett, he was a 1952 marathon Olympian, right? He was your competitor, right? Yeah. Do you remember any races you did against him? I did a lot. Yeah. But Ted could go to the longer ones, and I stood. I, I felt 15 kilometers was a good distance from there down. Mm -hmm. And a guy like Ted Corbett, he's only warming up 15 kilometers. 15 kilometers is 9.3 miles? Nine, nine and a... I think it's 9.3. So he was more comfortable with the, the longer distances and you like the oh, shorter yeah. ones. Ted? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Mm. What, was, what was your favorite distance, race distance? My favorite? Yeah. Again, the 15 kilometer. Uh, oh, so you like you like the fifteen yeah. k? Okay. It wasn't too long, but not too short. Yeah, I didn't have to go f like the marathon. I've sat down on the curb <laughs> in the marathons. Oh yeah. And wondered about do I get up and finish, ah. or do I go right back in? Oh, oh so you you <laughs> took breaks during the marathon, yeah. huh? Which marathons did you run? One of them in Boston, the Boston Athletic seemed to be all marathon men. Mm -hmm. And it's a big marathon. Yeah. You know, before New York City got rolling, the Boston Marathon was the thing yeah. to get in shape for and try. I see. Yeah, there was no New York Marathon. And, right. Uh, Do you remember a, a competitor? from Puerto Rico named Rudy Mendez. Does that ring a bell? Oh, Rudy Mendez. Yeah. yeah. Puerto Rico. Yes. Very good runner. Did something happen to him? Because I have here in the, my notes that he was a national and met champion in a 1956 marathon yeah. Olympian, but he was not sent to the games for some unfair reason. Well, Do you know why? I'm sorry, but I can't remember that. Doing but you remember competing with him? Yeah. Uh-huh. He was very good. I wonder if it had to do with discrimination. I, we're talking about when I was about at my peak, mm -hmm. and he's coming up. Yeah. So I didn't feel that it was we were competing. It didn't bother me to 
make a suggestion, <laughs> which is as big a head as you can get. Yeah. And I should give all the runners advice. Right. I'm not supposed to do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Did you compete against any runners who uh, engaged in head games while they were running? Yeah. Um, I used it in Yonkers one year where we had motorcycle police yeah. guarding us and I was able to ask them how far do we have to go? Yeah. How many hills? And when they said, oh, you got two good hills. Right. Said, you sure? Yeah, wonderful. So I may believe I was going out and they chased after me and I was only holding in. Yeah. But they all thought, oh, we've got them. Yeah. Then on the second hill was my turn to beat all of them. And that was the way I trained. Let the other guy think he's winning. But when it's all settled, you've got a finishing kick that nobody's going to match. <laughs> so you had a good finishing ki kick in your races? Yeah, pardon me? You had a good finishing kick? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, that's what I believed for the long distance runners. Yeah. If you're stronger at the end, that's more important than anything at the start, the middle, or anywhere else. Right, right. The last half mile, you should be able to run away from anybody you're running against. Right, right. And if not, go back to training and get that idea through in your workouts. Well, that's, that's great advice for, for any runner in any race. Yeah. I guess uh, that's why you were such a great coach. Yeah. Before the New York Roadrunners was formed, it was, it was hard to get to, to find races in New York, right? There wasn't too many races in New York. No, there were. Where did you have to go for races? Well, you had to go to Boston for one. Mm -hmm. And the, the New Jersey had a team. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to S think of who in New Jersey but I just can't. That's okay. Uh, I have one favorite that I liked. She was beautiful. A race or <laughs> a woman? Nothing to do with the race. It was a woman. <laughs> All right. Uh, you want to briefly tell me then? Since... <laughs> yeah. That was Jane. Yeah. And she was a world champ. Uh huh. And so I thought nothing to say, and I'm running alongside her. Yeah. <laughs> she was good motivation for you, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> So late 50s, 1958, uh, the local runners that you run with realized that there's not too many races around locally. So they started uh, a new organization called the New York Roadrunners Club in 1958. And the first president was Ted Corbett. Yeah. Uh, what, after the R New York Roadrunners was formed, how did, how did things change? Did things get easier? Teddy Corbett, great runner. Mm -hmm. Good man. But again, that meant they had to come in to Staten Island. And there was no rapid transit. You took the ferry boat and that ate up time. Mm -hmm. And there was no way you could go to Brooklyn and take a 69th Street ferry. Mm -hmm. But again, a lot of your energy, a lot of your time was eaten up by, by the traveling. Did, did races start after the Roadrunners? I know that was one, the main reason why they well, started it. They had to start on Roadrunners. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't much of a team. Okay, the first president of the Roadrunners was uh, Ted Corbett. The secretary treasurer was Harry Murphy. Harry Murphy. Um, yeah, tell us about Harry Murphy quiet guy, good man, and would help everybody and anybody in what they were doing. That's not 
presumptive. Maybe it's presumptive on my part, but Harry was a good man. And, you know, mm -hmm. these guys that conduct the races kind of insist that you have a medical. And a lot of us, I failed the medical. Oh, uh, you failed? Why did only, you fail it? Only one or two days before winning a national 15 kilometer. Very proud of that 15 kilometers. That became my favorite distance. Mm. And so I ran it, I win it, I go back. When I go to the draft board group yeah. in St. George by, well, right by the ferry, I go in and they said, oh, you, get on the cot. So I got on the cot. Yeah. Now my pulse had been in the 60s. Yeah. I get on the cot and fall asleep. And it's down in the 40s. And they're saying, you got a bad heart. We're here today. Yeah. Me with the bad heart and you with the bad ideas. <laughs> and that's it. So you got out of the military because you just ran a race that made it look like you had yeah. a bad heart? Yeah. Wow. Was that the Korean War at that time? Yeah. So and I went yeah. and said, I, I want to sign up. They said, you can't. You're classified 4F. <laughs> you failed. And I said, I just won a national championship for nine miles of running. And you're telling me I got a bad heart. That makes no sense. I went to the priest in St. Francis. And he said, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I said, they're telling me. He said, you don't owe anybody anything. Just accept it and go and do your running. Yeah. But don't go talking about it. Right, right. So would you rather run or, or serve in the, in the uh, Korean War? You'd rather run, right? <laughs> Running comes first. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, if we win the <laughs> Korean War, yeah. that's okay. Right, it's right. It's over in Korea. Yeah, exactly. I happened to marry one of them. <laughs> uh, you married a Korean woman? Yeah. Wow, how <laughs> ironic that whole situation is there. <laughs> yeah. uh, my three kids. Yeah. I'm half Korean. Amazing. <laughs> and I'm very proud of the three yeah. kids. Oh, wow. Jimmy, Billy, Annalie. Yeah. Let me run some names by you. The, the, starting with the formation of the New York Roadrunners Club in 1958. After Ted Corbett, who was the first president, John Conway served. Do you remember oh, John him? John Conway. Good yeah. Man. He served from uh, 1960 to 64. Could you tell me about him? He was good man. Quiet, not a winner, yeah. but not a loser. A member of the particular team he was with, mm -hmm. and I think it might have been the Pioneer Club. Mm -hmm. So I think he did his job as uh, head of the New York Roadrunners for a while. Yeah. Good, quiet. Not like us going on here with me. <laughs> I, I know a lot of the members of the Pioneer Club also became, like half of the New York Roadrunners Club were me also members of the Pioneer Club, yeah. right? Like yeah. at least half of them. Do you remember Aldo Scandura? Oh, Scandura. Who was uh, president of New York Roadrunners from Aldo Pico Order 66? Was a good man. Yeah. An engineer, architect. He had his house, his home built. Out on Long Island, 10 miles from his house door to his business office wow. in the Bronx. And it run through Long Island. Wow. And that, that was his training. Oh, so that he and would he run to work 10 miles each way. New York Pioneer Club. Wow. He was a good man, Aldo. Yeah. I couldn't believe that anybody would do that. 
built that house. He had it built intentionally from his house out on Memorial Island. To the Bronx. To his Bronx office. <laughs> wow. That's dedication. Do you remember Nat Cyrulnik at all? Nat Cyrulnik. Yeah, he was president from 66 to 68. He's a great long president. distance runner. Mm -hmm. He and his wife both ran together, but long runs. I have here that he was one of the first to develop a system of ranking marathoners worldwide, and he published an annual report. Yeah. He was the first all to rank I them. I can remember is when I was washed up and finished in my mind, yeah. I could run with Nat Cyrulnik's wife. <laughs> she looked for me because I was that bad, and I looked for her because she was good looking. <laughs> That's what's great about running. You could run with old, young, uh, male, female, you know, all walks of life, and you could all run together. That's, that's one, one of the many things I love about running. Do you remember uh, Vince Cepeda? Vince Cepeda. He was the president yeah. from 68 to Another 71. Long distance run. Yeah. I have here that he, he was one of the first to move races from the Bronx to Central Park while he was the leader. Oh. And he was the director of the first New York City Marathon in 1970. Yeah. And he also included, uh, he was the leading advocate for the inclusion of women into a, a long distance running. Vin Vince Cepeda. Yeah, Vince Cepeda, yeah. Good man. Yeah. Because I know at, at that time, I think, what was it, late 60s, women were not allowed to run the Boston Marathon yeah, at all. Right. Do you remember Barry Geisler at all? Barry Geisler? Yeah, he was New York Roadrunners president from 71 to 72. I know he was good. Yeah. But I can't remember, mm -hmm. you know, doing races with him. Yeah. And if he were in the room, he'd call me a dummy. <laughs> well, we're going into the 1970s now, so maybe... Uh, oh. Yeah, that, that's when you, you weren't really competing anymore, right? You were, you were coaching more than competing, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, I had uh, two guys who were like Marty Walsh, six city championships. Another one, Larry Sabato, good 447 seconds mm -hmm. back then. And Larry got in trouble, and the only thing saved him was his father was a sergeant mm -hmm. in the police department. <laughs> but Larry could have been great. Yeah. But if you're not cut out for college, you're doing it. Yeah. You know? But Marty Walsh won six city championships. Wow. Which is pretty good. He was your athlete? PSAL. PSAL. Mm -hmm. City champs. Yeah. Now, a lot of races during the uh, 50s and 60s, they didn't have water stops, right? There was no. no well, t tell me more about that. Well, they didn't realize the value of water. You know? Right. And it was like, wow. They had to make sure in the long run that there was somebody with water on the course. Right. And a lot of guys would be sitting on the curb because they didn't have any water. They were dehydrated, go. right? Dehydrated? Yeah. yeah. So it should have been, uh, if you're going to sponsor a race, you're also going to have to do the right thing by the runners in the race. Right. And that is have water stops along the way. I don't know how many, but it depends on the distance. Yeah, well, in the uh, New York Roadrunners races now today, uh, I think they have like a water stop every mile. Yeah. The New York Roadrunners Club got in trouble last fall, the last marathon, because uh, it was one of the, I think the most, the hottest, hum most humid day on record, and they ran out of water, and well, runner, runners were not, they, were, they, were, yeah. they really needed it. You, you know? want to kill somebody. Yeah, yeah. Occasionally sure, you do you hear train. runners drop. You train. Yeah. Sometimes two a day. Yeah. If I were married, I would have been doing two a day workouts. Yeah. Because that's how you win. Yeah, you know, exactly. You yeah. get that first one, it's an eye opener. Right. You just go out, 
jog. Yeah. Six miles, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the evening, from about six o'clock right. to eight, yeah. you get that real second workout, which means everything, which separates you from the boys, the boys from the girls. Ah, I just learned another secret about proper training to really do well yeah. in races. Huh? Zadipec. Twice a day. Yeah, Zadipec. Uh -huh. Zadipec, 40 times a 400. Wow, all in one workout, 40 quarter mile reps. Yeah. Wow. And he went to the Olympics, right? I should have shot him. <laughs> now, road race courses, they weren't accurately measured before the 1960s, right? Yeah. Like a race could be advertised as being 10 miles, but it might be like 9.3 right. or 11. Exactly. Uh, do you, you remember that this was a problem oh, at yeah. that time? Yeah. They just wanted to sponsor a race. Yeah. And give a damn about accuracy. Mm hmm And uh, was not unusual. Wow. Races in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. Boston area. So your favorite racing distance you said before was a 15K? That was your, that's your favorite distance? My favorite race? Yeah would be a 15 kilometer, mm -hmm. don't no matter which or where. That was the distance. Mm -hmm. And I knew how to run it, how to pace myself. And in my mind, I'm the winner for that. Mm. Short of that, Gordon McKenzie could run away from anybody. I think he made the Olympics twice. Wow. But you had to go from Staten Island to the Bronx to get beaten. No, that's not. <laughs> I'll go to a different distance. And the 15 kilometer, I felt comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I see. My personal favorite is, uh, is a half marathon, which is um, just a few miles more than that. Now, why, why was the Roadrunners Club formed? It was formed in 1958. Do you, do, you, do you remember why, why they formed it? So I think they said because there wasn't, there wasn't enough yeah. races in this area, right? New York City area? Yeah, you had to have uh, sanctions. Yeah. The AAU mm -hmm. wanted to control everything. Mm -hmm. And so to kind of balance it out, you had, you'd have a club. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it worked. Uh, and we saw the AAU mm -hmm. as officious, not official, but officious. They wanted control of everything. And how you tied your shoes, maybe. Ah. Uh, so, uh huh. So. So that, that was one of the reasons yeah, why they formed the New York for Road. For guys Road. like Gordon McKenzie and yeah. Teddy Corbett, thank God for them. They brought the sport to what it should be mm -hmm. and is. To the respectable level it is. Respectable, yeah. right? Yeah. I never met Ted Corbett, but from what I'm hearing and reading about him, he seems oh, like an amazing he person. Ran all day. I hope he ran all day because I want to get him. <laughs> Did you ever beat him? Oh, sure. He came to Staten Island and ran a few races. Mm -hmm. uh, I made the mistake of running in the same race. <laughs> <laughs> Teddy was good. Good man. What race did he run in Staten Island? Well, we would have a borough AAU championship. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, They'd have a separate set of awards mm -hmm. for local and uh, open division like that. Right. Ted Corbett was a good man. He'd run all day long if you let him. <laughs> <laughs> he could run in his sleep, right? <laughs> in his dreams. Look out, he's behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Innovation to the sport of long distance running uh, was done by the first generation New York Roadrunners. 
like from 1958 to 1970. Uh, could you tell me some of those innovations? Talk, yeah, I'll mention some of them with you, uh, and then maybe you could tell me more about them. For example, um, a club newsletter that was started by Ted Corbett. Do you remember that? Yeah. Only a couple of pages that size. Mm -hmm. And it would be in the 1940s or 50s. Mm -hmm. And it was good because we didn't have any uh, central point where results could be printed up right. from races in the Bronx. Yeah. Where Staten Island and Long Island. Right, and so this was decades before the, internet was invented, yeah. right? So the newsletter was a good thing. Mm -hmm. Every month you received it? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We're in the middle of the city, <laughs> I was going to say. It's downstairs in my cabinet. <laughs> Some of the results. Oh, you have it in your house? Yeah. Oh, you still have the newsletters in your this house? Is, yeah. Ah. We're in the studio in Manhattan right now. Yeah, right? yeah, right, right. Well, we'd have to travel but, an hour away to get them from your house. at home. Yeah. I had a cabinet with a couple of drawers. Yeah. And they had these newsletters. Mm hmm Every copy. Mm hmm Ted Corbett wrote. Maybe we could share photos of those newsletters once this episode is produced. Yeah. That'd, be, that'd be nice. Okay, so... Ultra marathon races, after the Roadrunners was formed, they started putting standard uh, formal events for ultra marathons. Do you remember when they started doing that? Ultras? Yeah. Had to go to Ted Corbett. Uh huh. I'm not into ultras. Yeah, yeah. No. I mean, you did tell me even running a marathon, you sat in the middle of the race. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I did one or two like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're not an ultra marathoner. No. <laughs> That was Ted's thing, right? Yeah. yeah. How about course measurement standards? Oh, course measurements. Yeah. Again, I would credit Bob Andrews, no, Bob Arasum mm -hmm. for measuring courses. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, that's Staten Island. I'm talking about yeah. New York Roadrunners like Ted and John Sterner. Oh, Stern, uh, yeah, I see, that's like distance. Mm -hmm. He's off in the Bronx, yeah. or he's at McCombs Dam Park. Yeah. And I take it for granted that those guys in the Bronx, yeah. or Manhattan, understood what they were doing. So I didn't go questioning that. Right. But I would. I would plan how I was going to run a particular race against particular guys. Mm -hmm. And in the Bronx, McCombstown Park was one of the areas where I would find these guys. So you had a strategy of how to race for each yeah. runner? Yeah. Wow, interesting. Uh, along with uh, the one by Yankee Stadium, also Van Cortlandt Park has a state has a, a quarter mile track mm -hmm. and I would run on those but I knew who could beat me mm. and so I, I wasn't going to lose any sleep over it let's put it that way right you know your limitations yeah I see now this is a standard for pretty much every race Roadrunners started the uh, age group racing where they would have uh, like masters over age 40 and youth. Remember when they started that? Yeah, I'm all for age groups. Yeah. And I don't think it should stop at 60. Mm -hmm. And most, if you look through your race charts, yeah. 60, 60 minutes. Yeah. Is it? Uh, you mean 60 years old? My age, what am I going to do with the 60 minutes? I'm <laughs> only warming up. That's right. John Gollop would say the same thing. Definitely Ted Corbett. You know, they need a race that's going to go for two hours, right. an hour and a half. Yeah. And that, 
you're going to do that, it should be measured out mm -hmm. so that they know that they've accomplished something. Right. Not just go run and then hit a finish line. Right. Do you remember any of the early women running pioneers? Not Cyril Nick's wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Cyril Nick, right? Yeah. Yeah. I have a few names here. Chris McKenzie, Anne Cyril Nick, Nina Kushik, and Catherine Switzer. I heard behind me shoes, leather shoes. It sounded, you know, scraping, and they were going fast. And he grabbed me by the shirt and threw me back. Boston Marathon, and they yeah. tried to pull her out of the race. Yeah. yeah. Kathy Switzer. Do you remember running with them? Well, they were in the race at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I am among the women. Jane. Jane was great. Yeah. World champ. Mm -hmm. Went to Belgium. And they screwed up on the measurements of like a world championship. Wow. In Belgium. Wow. She went crazy. Jane, <laughs> she'll beat me up. <laughs> but she'll get it if she hears that I did <laughs> this stuff. Oh, you still keep in touch very, with her? Very much. Uh oh. Yeah. Well, and she'll say, just <laughs> earlier today or yesterday. Yeah. Was there any activism among the runners? Like it says, Ted. John Sterner, Joe Kleinerman, Aldo Scandura, and Vince Chapetta. They were, they were uh, being very active with uh, getting involved with the AAU and the RRCA. Well, the AAU, again, was this, I don't know how to say it, top hat, you know, uh, we're in charge attitude. Mm -hmm. And that let us help you. We're going to run a 5K. And just so you know, it's 12 laps around the track from over there. Right. That's the road runners in comparison to my opinion of the AAU. We're running a 5K and get on the mark. Mm -hmm. That's it. Don't question where the mile mark is or anything else. Mm -hmm. It's what we give you, and that's it. Mm. It's a difference of uh, yeah, then, then that, perspective. Yeah, of it seems like they're what not... A possession, position is. Yeah, it seems like they want to be in too much control. Yeah, yeah. And not working together, right? Yeah, no. Do you remember the 1949 uh, Junior National AAU 15K champion? Oh, I, 1949? Yeah. I think I won on that. You won it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Surprise. Where did you run that 15 race? 15 kilometer. 15K. And it rained. We got out. And I, I know the town where we started is Staten Island. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we started from uh, <laughs> we started from <laughs> some place, and we ran to Clove Lake from the Stapleton start. It's this town, and we ran to Clove Lake, and around the one lake, yeah. maybe once or twice, and then back to the starting mark. Oh, to Stapleton? 15 kilometer, nine and a half, nine and a third miles. Yeah, 9.3. Uh, yeah. Was this a hilly race? Huh? Hills? Were there hills? Well, on Staten Island, if you did the right thing, yeah. it was always a hill. Yeah, I, I once uh, read that one third of Staten Island is very hilly. Yeah. And a lot of uh, runners who want to improve, they, they intentionally run on those hills. Yeah, in fact, well, I think it has the highest, that has think the it highest be point. Part of it. Yeah, it's yeah. It's a natural challenge. Well, nowadays, most races are done in parks because it's uh, cross prohibitive. 
to run in the street. Uh, it costs a lot of money to pay cops overtime. That's why pretty much only the roadrunners could still put on street races, you know? It's, most races today are put in the park, so it's hard to close off streets for a small... Uh, Prospect Park. Right, they do, they do all their races in the park. Yeah. The yeah. parade grounds. Yeah. Since we're talking about Prospect Park now, can you tell me more about Harry Murphy? Because I think he was the one who started oh, the Prospect Park Track Club. Beautiful man, good man. And when I was first starting, mm -hmm. he would give me advice as to what would be helpful. And he wasn't part of no roads. Mm -hmm. I saw the Pioneer Club as good guys. I had a coach that drove me crazy. Mm. <laughs> That's why I'm the way I am today. Why? Because he the drove coach, you crazy? Yeah. The coach at St. Francis College. Yeah. And I have a friend, Joe Anderson, who I told you about, parking his car on a hill because yeah. he had no brakes. And I'm sitting in the rumble seat. <laughs> so Joe would say, Bill, don't worry about coach. The guys he coached was 1932, 33. This is 1940s. Yeah. Stay with what you know. Mm -hmm. and don't say anything to the coach. Just do it. Right. Jack Brown. Okay. Was the coach's name, and he was tough. Mm. He was your coach? Yeah, he thought he was. <laughs> well, the toughest coaches he make was. the best runners, no? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's what Joe Anderson has told me. Brown, yeah, when did he coach? 1930, 1932. Mm. This is a different time. Right. Just do what he does, says. Yeah. Don't say anything. Yeah, don't talk when back. When he's done, come back onto the track and do a real workout. Zanapek was just coming around with his 20 to 40, 400s. Yeah, wow. Did you know Zanapek? No. Oh, that was a different time because period, right? He's in Czechoslovakia ah. or Hungary. I see. Hungarian, so. I think, Zadepec. So, um, so he never trained here, right? He was, no. Oh, I see, I see. Uh, um, if he came, he ran one or two races, and off he went. I see. So I never got a chance to meet him and talk to him about his workouts mm -hmm. and tell him how crazy he was. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 1950, the Metropolitan AAU 15K champion. One over Lou White, 1950. Lou White yeah. was a little guy. He was black, not white. Okay. <laughs> He'd smack me for that one. But Lou White was a good runner. He would say, you going to Boston? Yeah. Can I put my bike in the back of your car? We're going for the Boston Marathon. We're going to be there the night before. Sure. Mm -hmm. After the race in Boston, didn't matter whether I was the winner, the loser, or what. That's when he took his bike and went right back to the Bronx. He rode the bike from the Boston to the Bronx? <laughs> wow. <laughs> that same day he would ride his bike? Right? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> some crazy guys out there, and it wasn't with my club. The other guys, yeah. Scandura. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of yeah, yeah, names. Yeah. Three or four, Gollum. Yeah. They, they wouldn't talk to me. Really? Because I helped the wife. Ah. Uh, this is after the race, not during it. Right, 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 right. <laughs> you were racing all the way up to 1957, and these are like your career highlights. The last race you ran in 57, you scored a 30-second win over Ted Corbett in the Metropolitan AAU 25K Championship. Do you remember that one? No. Okay. Ted 
Corbett was a good man. Yeah. But he was a distance runner. Distance, mm hmm. And so you stay off the pace. Right. You get stronger and you sprint at the finish. Mm hmm. And you got a beat. Mm hmm. But, uh, you know, it's like you have to have confidence. You have to know what the opponent is doing. Right. And what you can do or have done. And get back to meeting that. Right. And usually, to be a police officer, not on a horse, but on a motorcycle, mm -hmm. going alongside. And I could say, whether we're in Boston or Rhode Island, wherever, I'd be in the lead and I'd ask him. How are we doing, officer? My father was a cop. Oh, you're doing well. How many hills, officer? Two. Mm -hmm. You sure? Yes. Great, thank you. And then I'd take off on one, and they'd all chase after me. But I knew there was one more to go. So you would knock them all out physically, right? <laughs> and then you would beat them. Then I would start that last mile. Yeah. After they all sprinted. <laughs> and I have them. It's a mental game. Yeah, yeah. But you have to do the training. Exactly. I didn't do that much training. Wow. But I'm by myself. Yeah. I would have been a much different if I lived in the Bronx or Long Island. Right, right. And uh, Vic Durgal, I don't know if he would share his workouts with me, <laughs> yeah. but he was a good runner. Okay. Two Olympics, I think. Wow. Ted Corbett the same way. Yeah. You're 93 years young now, and you're still going strong. Do you have any kind of routine that you still stick to? No. The only thing I can do or do is a walk. Okay. And I have a, a home aid, a house aid. Right. That walks with me and right. makes the pace one that I know I'm being <laughs> challenged to do it. Right. She's your pacer bunny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, what do you go around the block? Yeah. That's a 400 meters. Ah, so you do a 400 meters every day. I do, I try to do 400 every day. If I can't do it, I can't do it. I think we've been doing this all day. Yes. <laughs> well, it was a fun day, uh, you know, yeah. spending time with you. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Bill, I'd like to thank you for uh, today's episode. Uh, thank you for your time. And in talking about how the race scene was over the past said, 70 years, I would like to thank uh, the film crew, uh, Freddie, Carla, and Tiffany at Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And I'd like to especially thank Will Sanchez and also the, the impetus behind today's episode, Gary Corbett. Thank you, Gary, for put, doing the research that we needed to get today's special interview done. And this is Josh, and I gotta run. If uh, I said it was a pleasure, yeah, it will smack me. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pleasure though, <laughs> I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. had a wonderful conversation with Bill Welsh. It was the second time since 2019 that I was able to interview him. Uh, we had a great time this past hour and personally I am a professional pacer every Saturday morning for the Mile High Run Club and I love that job. Also you could find my book 
available on Amazon. And this is Josh. I gotta run. Thank you. Uh, just enjoyed having this conversation with Josh Besson. Gotta run. <laughs>